Maya, thank you for being here. We just had a phone call and um, Maya's really sorry that she can't join for the whole time, but she has her reason and I totally agree um, that they are important reasons. I'm The more I'm happy that she's here with us today uh, for, for the time we have her. So thanks a lot for being here again. Maya and I know us for quite some time and I just started to remember where we met. I don't really know, but I know that you gave a fabulous speech together with um, uh, Michael, Michael Pachmeier, uh, when we started our office of the Institute for Participatory Design in Oldenburg and you came with your baby and that was a really nice evening. And since then we have met uh, on various occasions, uh, especially at the, von Bernstorff estate, where there are the October discussions, a uh, similar group to this one for uh, transformational and sustainable talks uh, in Germany. Uh, each, uh, um, they are held in October. Maya, I will not go into um, telling this audience here all your professional titles and assets and what you've done and where have you been uh, secretary general and everything everyone can read that on wikipedia and everywhere else i know that maya at the moment is tirelessly campaigning um for uh climate issue climate change she is co-founder uh, as i understand it please correct me if i'm not right with gregor who is also here on the scientists for future uh, in Germany. And um, I see you more on television and the internet and listen to you, um, to your talks on the radio and news channels in Germany than I see you in person and in private, um, which is nice, but I also know how, um, yeah, what, what, what a fighter you are at the moment. And I really want to appreciate this here in this group. Maya, um, we put you on loud. Yes. Yeah. No, thank you so much. Um, I do think it is the time where everybody senses that the future is really wide open. And um, from research, we know that both the narratives and the people that are exposing themselves are really important at those periods to shift it uh, into the direction that we deem desirable. And I think when we look around the globe, there is obviously a different idea about how the future could look like, also trying to build its future. And this is why I'm very, very happy to be in this group. And I'm very, very grateful to Gregor because he has really been the kind of, the initiator that said, Maya, we need to do something. And I think we were a core group of five, but he was certainly the one that said, we need to speak up as scientists. Um, and I think that's, that's really been a remarkable um, turnout because everybody outside of the German speaking area might not know it was 26,800 scientists that signed up within three weeks, basically on a statement saying the protests of the young people are absolutely justified. When we noticed that in the political space, now that they got a lot of attention also from media and created a lot of explanatory necessity on the sides of those that didn't want to change, they tried to come back was saying that the young people are nice but should go back to school because they don't really know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And at the moment where we felt that's our responsibility now to also maybe tinker a bit around with the role of science in society and break out of what we've been given as a role to say we're claiming one that we understand is calling or is what is required now when we think about responsibility of people carrying the knowledge um, that we do. Mm, thank you, Maya. Maya, I would, because I hope for you this will be a little bit different, not only talking about climate change today, but uh, the conversation here in the Co-Creation Foundation is on global governance, on co-creation. Um, I mentioned the future cooking video we did together. I should also mention two books you wrote. One is published in English, actually, The Great Mind Shift. Um, Alistair will post the link to that in the chat. And also now you published a new book, which is quite a success, I heard, and have seen um, Unsere Welt Neu Denken, oder Die Welt Neu Denken. 
And from both titles, I think we, uh, we see that your main focus of inquiry is really how to think in new, new paradigms, new narratives, and what is necessary from, from this point of view to make the change and the transformation we are already in, but we now have to maybe even consciously co-create or together um, um, to, to, to shape in a way that it will actually bring us the future we, we all hope for. And in the video you use, we, we finish with, uh, I think, a very strong um, point you made. And you said, we are following the wrong heroes. So what's wrong about those heroes? And what kind of heroes do you think we should follow? Mm. Well, I, I think it is um, both the kind of idea of success that they are many, well, or person, the personalization of. When we look at, uh, it really hit me in the newspaper around New Year's when they say the most successful or wertvoll is a German term, which means full of value, if you translate it into English. So valuable companies uh, of the world. And then you look at the top list and you see that there's all the IT companies and the finance companies that we totally know are really avoiding taxes as they can, have benefited massively from buybacks of their shares after they've given public money or been given public money in tax reduction. So when you think about what is a good conduit or business in the proper term that we think about what should be a decent businessman or decent businesswoman, and that you give back to the community in which you are residing and from which you're benefiting, because obviously the people are being educated, especially in places where there is public education for free. You've got an infrastructure, you've got police looking out that it's safe and everything. So all what we use taxes for, usually kind of protection of the common good in best uh, cases at least, is something that you don't feel like you need to contribute to, but you're sucking out all the revenue of the people that are living in those places or using them as employees and you lose the roads, etc. And especially in the context of uh, digital, obviously you also use the people's collaboration because we all contribute by putting in a lot of data. And I think Michael knows that much better than I do. We are co-creating the kind of products that they make profits with then. And still nothing comes back to the kind of people in that area, at least through kind of taxation. So how can we call those the most valuable companies? Why is the list such? And why is the list not a list that has a, an idea that you're also serving a system that you're embedded in. And this is for me the bigger shift that we're looking at right now. How do we get from extractive ways of making something into regenerative ways where the activities that you're doing are always being undertaken from being cognizant about that it has a feedback loop into the system that you're operating in. Mm -hmm. And that tax example is just one, obviously in ecosystems, we have it in a totally yeah. visible way as well. So this is for me the bigger shift that we really need to look at and then understand what are the heroes <laughs> and what is the kind of idea or heroism there. Um, so the nurturing of the systems rather than using them to become the top of the pops according yeah. to weird indicators that are not really telling us much about future. What are your heroes then? My heroes are the ones that can see the future emerging. And I think uh, when you think about Bernstorff and the kind of gatherings I had, for me, it was Claudine Niert, who's also one of my heroines, by the way, because she does a lot of the facilitation of how do you bring people together so that they can bring out the best in themselves. They get the best available knowledge to then decide democratically what are the moves forward. So what are the spaces and the places and the culture and the holding that is required for that to be happening? And she was saying that there is this group of people that are future seers and future seekers. So they, they, they understand what is possible if we do get back into the more collaborative mode, if we understand that it's much more of a circuit than of a linear direction, that is what life is all about. And um, to me, that, that is the essence of what we should be looking at when we look for solutions that are sustainable and have a space for everyone. Mm -hmm. If we dig a little bit deeper at that point, I think, we also spoke about the concept of modernity. And when I hear about the, you talking about the wrong heroes, yeah. I've got the impression that um, they are heroes beca because of the paradigm or the narrative of modernity, maybe. Uh, the, 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 the paradigms and, and values of progress, of growth, of success, and they shape how we 
or that we see these people as, as heroes. Um, but when we come back at modernity, uh, why do you think should we overcome it? And uh, just keep in mind that many people here, I think, coming from integral, meta-modern, or other mindsets who claim to already be on this way. Well, how do you see that? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, um, when I think about modernity, the first thing I have in my association, Riam, is the Charlie Chaplin film of modern times, right? And so everything is in this very manufactured way, this very industrialized way, this very linear way of aligning little cogwheels so that they can all move forwards in one direction. So there is no circuit, there is no cyclical um, image even when you think about it. I mean, the whole term comes from always the newest, mm -hmm. the roots of the term itself. And what I feel we've come to now is a paradigm where you can't let anything stay the way it is, even if it works perfectly well, because you have to change it technologically or economically or something in order to make, make it a successful thing, because the only thing that we measure is something being changed and thus being sold in a different way. And that's obviously the whole way that we've been dealing with nature. Instead of just saying, hey, she really has got it figured out. <laughs> How do we really embed our process of dealing with her so that she can do the best and continue doing the best? And we are nurturing her and serving those processes and even cultivating them. It's not just to stand back and let her do her thing because I think the, the ability of humans to understand processes can do some degree of development. But what we've been doing is to just be focusing on producing a few things that we deemed very useful for us at that particular time and forgot about a lot of the other things that are happening there as well. And when we now saw how Corona hit um, our societies, I think there are lots of parallels there too, where we thought, oh, it's not as productive. So we're not earning as much because we can't squeeze in as much technology and the technological change meaning we can up productivity, meaning we can up what we can squeeze out an hour. That's not very, cognizant of how living systems times work but it's basically following the path of what technological systems are able to do and then we've got the 0101 algorithms and a lot of speed but it's not in the timing of living systems so how do we get out of this this notion of as fast as this the kind of machine can go and create new that for me is the kind of, and maybe I'm a bit too tough on modernity there. I'm very happy to listen to other people's views. But for me, that is the, the like mega machine is something that comes to my mind quite quick, quickly when I think about modernity. Yeah, and um, you, you just gave two terms. You said cyclical and living systems. So does that already point so into the next stage or what you think the, the, the paradigm, the next paradigm should be? Like, what do we already have criteria? I mean, I hear a lot of people talking about new ways of thinking, about new paradigms, new narratives, but I actually don't hear them. Mm -hmm. And I, I all, all, always wonder what would be the criteria we already know at the moment these new paradigms should consist of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I hear you saying cyclical living system, okay, that sounds a bit, a little bit systemic, but I, I get an idea where you might point it, but could you be more explicit or do you have even maybe a sort of a, a vision or, or some metaphors or something to mm -hmm. um, make more clear what you mean by these new paradigms we need to have? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, the biggest difference between um, a, what I deem also be part of the modern paradigm is what we in science call the methodological individualism, which means that you look at one element in as much detail as you can and try to understand that element to then think that you can aggregate from the behavior of that element at one particular time that you looked at it into the behavior of the whole system. And economics is just the kind of core discipline that's been doing this with a representative actor of us seeking to always have more utility. Or you can have it with machines when you try to understand how is this cogwheel looking like and how, if we put them all together, the big machine will look like. But once life kicks in, that's out of the mechanics, that's out of where you can aggregate from the behavior of one into the behavior of the big, because it's not cogwheels, because we all have 
different ways of being and different ways of reacting. So the focus on of a systems view, as I understand, there are different schools of system thinking, obviously, but the one that I adhere to really says we have to look at the relationships much more than the elements, because the relationships will determine also how elements evolve. And that's the interesting, obviously, and very encouraging way to look at it. Evolution doesn't stop with Homo economicus, right? I mean, it does continue. Yeah. And so I understand our current motivation, including our preference, including our routines, as something that is co-emerging between the structures and the behavior of the people. And the connecting element for me, there are the stories, right? So the kind of rationalization of why this solution would be a good one. And then the solution comes around, we observe it as something as a reality, it's just the way it is. And then that influences a lot what we think is a possible um, next step. Mm -hmm. So there is this, I mean, there's lots of sociologists like Anthony Giddens and others that always try to go into those relationships. But I think that's the core cool emphasis of everything that is a systemic paradigm. Mm -hmm. And then you can understand how relationships are serving elements to unfold their potential or not so much. Yeah. And this is for me, maybe one of the bigger um, shifts in what do you look at and where do you see the intervention points that might also be. And another one that I find really, really important when we think about the spirit basis is that the Western view had a look at humans as a deficient uh, creature. Mengelwesen is the German term that a lot of psychology works with. So we're considered to be something that is not really there, not really finished, not really at its best. And so we keep on learning and doing, and, but it's not unfolding the potential that's already in us, but overcoming a lack that we still carry in us. And for me, that is a whole different way of looking at people from Buddha nature, for example, where you say, we all have it already in us. It may be overcast here and there, it may have got blemished or anything, but it is something that you already hold. And that is a totally different um, view of humans. And then it is all about kind of tickling out what we have in us, whereas the Western thing is like drilling into us because we're deficient. And unless we're laden with everything, we can't ever be the ones that are bringing this out. And in this in itself, for me, are really hugely different ways of looking at what's happening. It's really difficult to speak about it, isn't it? I feel like we're really, what, while using our language, we're really trying to struggle to, to show the difference between where we come from paradigmatically and where we want to go to and we're really sort of trying to even form the terms and so to make them fit to to, to match the concepts of of life I, I i listen to you and i i i get an image of life per se as such um but finding the right terms to describe it in a non modern modern way maybe but i i think um you said think, relational yeah. yeah no i'd like to get tick to that point because yeah, i would love it if people from other cultural backgrounds with other languages because i notice so much when i'm in a different language i am sort of also a slightly different person because i can express things differently and we do obviously have a lot of terminology in Asian cultures and other places that would allow for us to speak about what we're trying to express also in a different way yeah. and either the the language that we have at our availability as Wittgenstein's always been saying is already a kind of snapshot and a cutting out one bit of reality and the potential of reality in a particular way and that I, I agree with you I've been struggling we've been talking about what could replace this thing like modernity and it's you like surely it was a stupid term at the beginning people were saying what the hell are they talking about so how did it become something to catch on and what be the kind of imagery or the the kind of promise because modernity was the kind of new thing had this progress idea with it right so what's the promise that we're after right now um, the promise being enough the promise being good enough the promise for me at least, is, is something that is, oof, you're okay, I'm okay. <laughs> and we can just also leave things the way they are if they work all right. You can stop running in this hedonic treadmill and this like race against everybody. Because, But I can't, yeah, I, I haven't found, so I would love it if people had ideas about how to capture the essence of what we feel could be the next level. Mm -hmm. My friend written a book about the economics of arrival which tries the same thing. Like, look, we need to grow up. We are now a grown up economy. We have enough, but we can't stop. That's <laughs> quite tragic, really. Sure. But 
So everybody's looking for, for that way of expressing it. So yes, I think language is hugely yeah. important there. And let me just sort of make the, the arc of this short conversation, uh, bring it to the beginning and to the end. Um, we're meeting here because we, we discuss new ways, hopefully co-creative ways, which might be even a different term for being relational uh, and, and being alive, being generative, um, global governance. You're now sort of in campaigning for, for climate change uh, for, for, for the last decade, maybe even longer. And I wonder if you think from the perspective of the paradigm you just started to describe, what would global governance have to look like as a sort of living relational affair, public affair? Um, well, I think we've been trying to look at what are qualities um, of relationships that are, I, I've seen poiesis, I really like it, Inja, because autopoiesis has been something that from the systems thinkers is trying to lead to this ability of systems to adapt by themselves to changing circumstances, right? And to keep the aliveness in them by adaptation. Um, and to a certain degree, that's where Eleanor Ostrom's works come in when thinking about the commons. So what are possibilities? What are the rules and the principles? So the kind of ways that we relate to each other again, um, that allow for us to self steer so that it is not so much about someone telling each other or arrest what they can do or everybody owning something by themselves and then telling everybody else what they can do about their share, which have been the former two solutions. Yeah. All of that research, it needed for a certain amount of feedback loops between people and a visibility. So you had a reputation and a reputation to lose. And they all had something like a sanctioning mechanism. And I think sometimes the progressives like to forget about this, but she was very clear that it has to be a sanctioning if you're not adhering to the rules that this system has given itself so that it can kind of stabilize itself through the feedback loops between its people. And then there has been research to think about how can we bring that to the global realm. But I yeah. think for now, it's always been nodal because people were cognizant of the feedback loops being the kind of essence that keeps this thing thriving and in relationship and in correcting itself. But then you have a principal agent problem because these people, if they're sitting together on the global space, they might can come forward with decisions, but then they don't quite know if those are going to be accepted on national level or even subnational level. So they're always speaking for someone else rather than being themselves in those arrangements. So this is something where you have to think about the, the more vertical or how do you integrate between the nodes? And I think there's a lot of tech people on here. So this is probably where the paradigm of the connectivity uh, and we think about how digital is being used. Some are really ramming it into the old paradigm. So more control of the linear systems and no one falls out of line. Whereas others are really feeling into how can we use this as a potential to get into the decentralized ways of um, yeah, checking and balancing that could exceed what we've seen, locality being important or size being important. But there are some of the people on the call have probably a lot more knowledge than I do. But just yeah. when we think about the patterns that we want to support so that this kind of quality of feedback looping can happen, for me, would be the starting point when I think about global governance. Right. Thank you, Maya. Mm -hmm.